Last time on Dreams of Another Woman's Star. What is that? That doesn't sound like any of the alerts. Captain, nothing is making any sound. How can you not hear that? It's Captain. Captain. Captain! Shut up, phone. I developed some auditory hallucinations. Dr. Bovlin believes I stood up too fast and that I need to increase my iron intake. No one really knows what dark energy is. I mean, we're light years away from doing this, but dark energy moves stuff. So, if it can move planets and galaxies, why can't we use it to turn a crankshaft? You can do that? That's the point of the experiment. To find out. The Grovelins have asked us to intercede on their behalf. I understand, Ambassador. And you also understand that what the Egek are doing to the Grovelins is criminal, malicious, and generally the stuff of nightmares. Egek is a consortium. About 200 years ago, they were a private entity which took some of the earliest steps in deep space exploration. She's not me. I mean, I see the dream through her, but... Captain Astrid... Captain Astrid is a new Dr. Astrid. You're with the new owners? I am. This is just sort of a hello, nice to meet you, we don't really bite sort of thing. We used to be an acronym for Energy Exploration and Global Applications Corporation, but the marketing boys wanted us to rebrand. Officially, we're one word. EGAC. Egak. I need you to take this seriously. It's a terrible name. That's not the point. Or is it? I'm pretty sure I said it wasn't. You asked me to listen to you with an open mind. You don't get to make that request if you don't share the same courtesy. I also asked you to take this seriously. And I am. The name Egak sounds like something out of a science fiction film. The thing that ate Madagascar or whatever. It's not a pleasant sound with gack in the name, and it just feels off. The word, if you can even call it that, is exotic in an uncomfortable way, so you're in the middle of a dream and your subconscious needs a villain to tell the story it wants to tell you. Boom! Egack. I see two problems with that. I think I can guess them both, but go ahead. For one thing, these aren't dreams. You have them when you're asleep. Only when you're asleep. You wake up and the experience is over with no evidence that happened except memory. No one else shares this experience, and it leaves no physical evidence of existing. I don't understand in what way these are not dreams. They're too... vivid. So they're vivid dreams, but that's all they are. A tall antelope is just an antelope. It doesn't suddenly become a giraffe. They're not just dreams. I can't explain it, but they're different. Time and space don't shift. Everything happens logically. There are aliens, and the ship is traveling faster than light. Tell me that you experienced the whole thing as though your mind is a passenger in someone else's body. Somebody light years and centuries away from you. That isn't logical. It is inside the dream. Think about what you just said. I only called it a dream because I don't know another word for it. That might be because another word isn't needed, but okay. I absolutely concur that these are odd dreams, not like any I've ever had, and not like any you've ever had before. I don't know what that means, and I do think we need to find out, but that doesn't refute the argument that your subconscious latched onto the name Egak. But I never heard the word outside the dream before that woman mentioned it. Or you did, but your conscious mind didn't remember it. Or maybe you only saw them written as letters. You didn't consciously turn the anagram into a word, but subconsciously you did? I'm positive I didn't do that. <sighs> okay. Okay? You're the physicist. You know what Occam's razor is better than I do. I can argue that point until we're both blue in the face, but you didn't come here looking for a logical argument. You've probably had that with yourself a dozen times. You asked me to take this seriously, so let's ignore other possibilities and go with what you're thinking. You're having dreams or 
visions or whatever you want to call them, they're telling you that in a few centuries, the company you're working for will become... What? I don't think I understand it entirely. A rival for some kind of alien United Nations? I don't... Rival probably isn't right. But the two organizations are at odds. EGAC is committing crimes against humanity, or alienanity, or whatever. Let's keep the tenses straight. It might be important. That's what they will be doing a few centuries from now. So what are you supposed to do about it in the now time? I'm not sure. Stop them, I guess. Maybe that's why I'm having these dreams. It's a message from the... Gilan? It sounds stupid when I say it out loud. Am I a bad husband if I agree with that statement? <sighs> no. You're taking this seriously, which is what I asked you to do. And in all seriousness, I don't see what you could possibly do here. Even if this is a message from the future, it's not a clear message. Should you stop working for EGAC? Throw away all the work you've done on the project that could possibly earn you a Nobel? Or are you supposed to keep working with them? Guide them in a different direction from within? Or does it even matter? Wasn't there that paper you read about time being fixed? Can't really change the future? That was a theory, yes. But it was hardly proof. <sighs> Amy. Honey. I'm sorry, but this whole conversation is theory. Your gut is telling you this isn't just a dream. Your instincts are telling you EGAC is bad. Maybe that's enough. I mean, I don't think it is, but maybe you saw something subconsciously, which is ringing the alarm bells. Maybe you do need to get away from this company. But I think you need to be sure. I think if you, the scientist I fell in love with, makes a decision like this based on a feeling... Honey, I think that could be a big problem for you. That is... accurate. If I don't have a reason, a logical, evidence-based reason to leave, I can't. Maybe someone else could. Heck, Captain Astrid could. But if I tried to? No. I'd be beating down the doors begging them to take me back within a month. On the other hand, what you say about my subconscious makes sense. Maybe there is something I saw in the data without really seeing it. I would say sleep on it, but... But that's more or less the problem. Yes. You look terrible. And you are horrible with protocol. That's no way to address your superior officer. I'm sorry. You look terrible, sir. If I were on duty... Then you would be taking pains not to show how bone-weary you are. I know this because I've served with you on more grueling missions than this, and I can spot the difference between my captain coming for an official visit and my friend Astrid coming for a less official reason. If I'm wrong, let me know now before I pour this sake. If I'm right, I'll pour you one. You are right, but none for me. Thank you. All right. Karana, will you join me? You know I hate to drink alone. For humans, ethyl alcohol is a low-level poison with side effects many of you find pleasant. For my people, it is a high-level toxin with a side effect of nearly certain death. I suppose I'm drinking alone, then. My people have a somewhat similar experience when ingesting certain acidic compounds. If the situation is dire enough, I can join you in imbibing this, if you will offer it to me. That is balsamic vinegar. Knock yourself out. I hope not to drink that much. Still nothing for you, Astrid? I've never seen anything but a medical reason keep you from a good glass of sake. You still haven't. I don't have anything helpful like a diagnosis, but that didn't stop the doctor from suggesting I avoid alcohol. And caffeine. And most of the other things that make my life bearable. How long have you been off caffeine? Long enough that one of my best friends thinks I look terrible. I have a question. I probably have an answer. What's up? What are the odds of getting a communique satellite off before we reach Gravel? Who's asking? My captain or my non-drinking buddy? Because if my captain is giving me an order... She is not. I can't give this as an order, since it's not official business. I just need to... To talk with your husband. If it can't go out until we're back under sublight propulsion, I understand. I just... 
miss him. And most of my other diversions have been outlawed by the dog. So, I'm stuck in my cabin, waiting for you two to get off duty so I have friends to talk to, instead of a subordinate. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. It seemed like a good use of my time to prepare him a hollow chip. But like I say, I'll get it if this can't go out until we cut into sublight. Can't is a strong word. I can do it. It's just super hard. I wouldn't even offer if it were anyone else. Look, when we go faster than light, we're not really going faster than light. We're traveling about one-tenth the speed of light on a good day. But because we're going through a tesseract, that's how we can get where we're going in less than a century. Or three. How much do you know about tesseracts? Only what they teach in piloting classes. Okay, well, that's not terrible. Have you been to a piloting class? I didn't say good. I said not terrible. You can't really broadcast, communicate inside a tesseract, which is why we use the drones to carry information. We did cover that, yes. I know tesseracts basically shred radio waves or anything like that. And they don't work well with gravity, which is why we needed to travel a certain distance from a star or black hole before we opened this one. See? Not terrible. I'm also sure you know how, when you're inside a tesseract, and for whatever reason you need to avoid what you're heading toward, you go from pumping out massive amounts of energy to pumping out ludicrous amounts of energy. Slipstream shut down. The first thing they teach you not to do if you can help it. See, this is why engineers hate pilot jargon. A tesseract isn't a slipstream. That's an aerodynamic phenomenon which has nothing to do with space travel. But anyway... Right. Well, the reason you're pumping out that extra energy is that a tesseract connects two fixed points in space. Trying to shift one of those two points when you're inside one is a massive undertaking. No drone has that kind of energy. So launching a communique drone while in a tesseract means that the drone has three choices. First, it can go to the end point of the tesseract with you. In which case, why bother launching inside the tesseract at all? I'm guessing option two is to go to the beginning point of the tesseract? Yes, and that's how it's supposed to be done if you're going to do it, but it takes some reprogramming. That way the drone isn't operating under the assumption it's departing from where your ship is currently located. We always have one drone set up to do just that, but that's supposed to be for emergencies only. I'd have to set up another one for you. The numbers for the calculations are constantly changing based on your position in the Tesseract. It's kind of like lining up four moving targets at once. But I can probably make it happen if you bribe me sufficiently. And the third option? The drone does what it's supposed to do. It opens its own tesseract and heads for the nearest station where the data can be downloaded. The problem is that a tesseract connects two fixed points in space. If you try to open a tesseract inside of another tesseract, it's like you've introduced a third point in space for the drone to exit. And that's bad. I thought you were not drinking. I haven't been. And yet you ask this question? Of course it's bad. It has the potential to be bad. Sort of like Karana and balsamic vinegar, apparently. If you've done the math right, you can get the drone to punch a hole in the tesseract you're in while using some of the energy which maintains the portal to patch up the hole for you. And if you haven't done the math right? The tesseract collapses, and the ship is torn to atom-sized pieces and scattered throughout time and space. There might be some fission explosion as some of the larger elements are ripped apart, but at that point, it's no longer a worry for you as you're already extremely dead. So, going back to option two, what sort of bribery were you thinking? Why are you staring at my lunch? I've never noticed you putting balsamic vinegar on anything before. I don't imagine you would have. For one thing, it's not every day that I have the energy to pull you away from your desk and tell you to eat food like a normal person. On those days when I do, odds are good that you have seen me eating leftover Chinese food from the night before or a turkey and cheese sandwich. I was out of both of those this morning, so I threw together a salad and thus balsamic vinegar. So I haven't seen you eating balsamic before now? Like, ever in my life? I really don't know. But not recently? You understand this question is objectively weird, yes? This is why I was staring at your lunch. I was trying to find a way to make it not weird. I'm not sure that was ever an option. No, Dr. Astrid. To the best of my recollection, I have not eaten balsamic vinegar in front of you within the past few months, if not longer. I don't actually like salads. Thank you. If you make me ask you why I just faced a grand inquisition over my salad dressing... I had another dream. It 
featured balsamic vinegar, and I was looking to see if my subconscious might have pulled that from somewhere. Hmm. Maybe lead with that next time. May I join you two? Sure, Nick. But it's dangerous territory for salad eaters. Tuna salad okay? Have a seat, Nick. Thanks. It's not normally so crowded in here. Well, I imagine the new vending machines help. That's probably true. They have... What's the best way to say this? Real food? I mean, I love four-year-old peanut butter on crackers as much as the next guy. And the two new microwaves. Plus the bigger refrigerator. This is almost a functioning kitchen. More people are bringing a lunch instead of going out to eat. New owners, deep pockets. You won't hear me complain. Can I ask you guys something? What do you know about the new owners? Do we have any background on EGAC? I looked them up on the internet when the takeover became finalized. As I recall, you were there looking over my shoulder at the time, so I imagine you know approximately the same things I know. Okay. Nick? Not sure what you're asking. Neither am I. I guess I'm looking for any red flags. Anything I should be worried about. Nothing really comes to mind. They're an energy company. They probably depleted well more of Earth's resources than was their fair share, but that sort of comes with being good at what they do. I'm sure there's some corruption somewhere if you look close enough, but I would be telling you the same thing about any company this size. And to be sure, I've covered my butt sufficiently. I have no specific knowledge of any wrongdoing. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. You appreciate me saying next to nothing at all? You're easily satisfied. You know what I mean. Do you know something the rest of us don't? You never indicated a lot of concern with our previous corporate citizenship. Like Nick, I have no specific knowledge of any wrongdoing. But you have a feeling something's wrong. I didn't say that. Well, I am. I'm saying exactly that. From the day Nick told us the company had been sold, I've been waking up with a sort of gloom I can't begin to place. I feel like I'm one of the guys designing a doomsday weapon for an evil overlord. To be clear, I'm working on the same project I was working on before. Now it feels... I don't know. It feels sinister. You feel it too. I feel something. I have since EGAC put through the first bid to purchase this. It was a reasonable offer on the company, and literally zero reasons not to take it. Too good to be true? Not even. It was, as I say, entirely reasonable. The old owners got to line their pockets, but it wasn't anything to raise eyebrows. Most of the employees kept their old salary or got a slight increase. Sure, we have a better cafeteria and a few other upgrades, but nobody's running home to their family shouting, Our troubles are over! These aren't suspicious or shady dealings. They're just what they are. Anthony thinks maybe I've noticed a problem subconsciously. I tend to agree. And I tend strongly in the other direction. What do you mean? I mean, you two have been exposed to the change for about a week. You've gotten the new coffee mugs with the new logos. You've seen the new benefits packages and the new cafeteria. Something seems strange to you, but you can't put your finger on it. So you say to yourself, you'll keep your eyes open and try to figure out what's bothering you. That's more or less it. Yes. Except I've had this feeling for months. The feeling doesn't go away, and at the same time, I haven't been able to determine what's causing this feeling. I've been caught in the land of the mixed metaphors where a man will not look a gift horse in the mouth while he's waiting for the other shoe to drop. So what do we do? We make a choice. We either listen to our instincts... And apparently the instincts of at least a few other people. It's more than a few. Or we listen to the data. Harry, you, and I are scientists. Nick... You do finance. That's not the end-all, be-all of my existence, but yes. My brother has a gambling addiction, so I know better than a lot of people what instincts really count for in the end. I feel better. You do? Because the fact that other people have sensed a nameless dread does not make me feel better about my decision to stay the course. I admit it doesn't appeal to me either, but you know what does make me feel better? I bet I do. It's the fact that I've made a choice. I decided to make a decision. And I did. It's possible for a decision to be wrong, you know. It is. But that still feels better than no decision at all. Computer, how long until we exit the Tesseract? At present velocity, 3 minutes, 12 seconds. Corona, 
Beginning exit point scans. We need to know if there are any EGEX ships out there. You do understand that is the point of an exit point scan. Ambassador, please let my crew do their job. Scan complete, Captain. Recommended gravity shields at 40%. 40? Is there a debris field? No, sir. Entry point is clear, but there is a ship in the vicinity. An EGEX ship? Ambassador, enough! They knew we were coming as soon as we encountered the last set of attackers before we opened the Tesseract. Computer, gravitational shielding at 40% of maximum at 0.5 seconds after exiting. Complying. You're giving them a half second once we exit to take a pot shot at us? Dora, shut him up. You can't! She very much can. Would you like me to remove him from the bridge? Do what you like, but keep him out of my hair. Karana, will the ship be in our direct path on exiting? No, sir, but not far off. Shall I implement evasive maneuvers? Negative. I want a dead stop within five seconds of exiting the Tesseract. Not recommended at current velocity. Then reduce current velocity. I want us still as a statue with every sensor on the ship sent to maximum range. I don't understand what she's doing. Well, you don't necessarily have to, but it looks to me like the captain doesn't want us working blind when we get out of the Tesseract. The exit scans only show us what we're headed towards. We don't know what will be on our aft. And the one thing nobody will be expecting is for us to come straight out of a Tesseract and stop dead. We should go out with our shields already up. Exiting a Tesseract in a ship one-tenth the size of Pluto is not a situation where adding extra gravity is what you would call helpful. Look, you pretty clearly have no idea what you're talking about, so maybe just don't talk. Weapons teams, I want you locked and loaded, but do not fire unless you hear my command. Exiting Tesseract in ten seconds. All hands, brace for a sudden deceleration. Five. Four, three, two, one. Report. Two more ships behind us, Captain. They're similar to the ships which we encountered before we opened the Tesseract. Shields to 60%. Engage sublight propulsion. 10% power. I want at least some momentum if we need to maneuver. Comply. Incoming communication request from the ship off our bow. Open communications. Alliance ship, you are currently trespassing in EGAC controlled space. Please return to your place of origin. Or just get out of our territory, we're frankly not picky. This is Captain Astrid of the Alliance ship Forsvar. We are on a diplomatic mission to- No, you're not. A diplomat is an invited guest. I have been invited. The Gravellans have issued a call for assistance. That was a splinter group which speaks for its own membership only and had no authority to issue such a request on behalf of the entire populace. Can we step back a moment, please? Whom am I addressing? Commandant Gerda Lee, and now that we all know who we are, go away. We are here to investigate the claims made by the Gorellans. We do not recognize your authority to do any investigations of any kind. This area of space is not under the control of Planetary Alliance, and the EGAC Consortium frankly is not interested in investigations which we believe to be truly designed to uncover technology we consider to be ours alone. Ambassador Golnix, I believe this is your area of expertise. Commandant, I'm patching in Ambassador Golnix of the Alliance Interstellar Relations. Oh, good. Will he understand you have no business being here? Commandant, surely you understand we cannot simply ignore a cry for help. Founding principles of the Interplanetary Alliance include the equal protection of all sentient life. Laudable. Irrelevant, but laudable. This is our territory, and we will determine the best way to oversee it. Whether you agree with our methods is of no concern to us. You have evidently seen the content of the Gravelin request for assistance. If even a portion of the alleged atrocities are true, we cannot turn our backs on the situation whether we have technical jurisdiction or not. Our goal is not to impinge on the sovereignty of the EGEC Consortium, but to investigate the Gravelin claims that they are under assault by an aggressor state. You came here, in that floating pile of ammunition, ready to dictate what behavior you find acceptable or not, and you accuse us of being the aggressor? 
Planet Gravel is not your concern, and I see no reason why we should let you come and dig around to see what you object to and what you don't. I assure you that it's more than a mere objection. I speak with the full backing of the Alliance when I say that we will be investigating and taking whatever steps are necessary to end these atrocities. If, as you say, there are no atrocities, you have nothing to worry about. And I assure you, Ambassador, I am not worried in the slightest. If you make any move from your present location which does not look like you're preparing to leave this system, we will consider it to be the act of aggression which it truly is, and we will respond accordingly. This conversation is over. Communication channel inactive. <sighs> Captain, I'm afraid this is back in your hands. We have been sent to do a job. Leave it to you to determine how best to do it. Computer, what are the objects circling the EAC ships? 94% likelihood they are unmanned drones. Spectral analysis indicates high-density outer casing. Ultimate purpose, unknown. I really don't like that. Chances they were designed to give you personally some sense of satisfaction. 0. 0.000... Not helping. Orders, Captain? The basic strategy is sudden and overwhelming force but I want all our bases covered. Three of those pods surrounding each of the other ships. I want our nine biggest guns aimed straight at those pods. Not at the enemy ships? Do I have to have Dora deal with you again? No, not at the enemy ships. I have some idea of what the ships can do, and no idea about the pods. We atomize the unknown quantity first. These could simply be a decoy designed specifically to draw our fire. Say what you like about this ship, but when it comes to blowing things up, we have something of an embarrassment of riches. They will sense our shields going to full, so we'll have to risk the first volley while we're still at 60%. I want the grab shields and propulsion at maximum as soon as possible after that. We should be able to take them all out at once, but I want the ship at our bow to be the primary target. Give me at least one direction we don't have to guard against. Hi, Captain. Comply. On my mark. Now. <laughs> Hello? Hello? <gasps> whoa, 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 easy, easy. You okay? Drink this. Thank you. N not that I'm complaining, but you happened to have hot tea when I woke up. I just got home and found you asleep on the couch. You were tossing and turning, and I knew this was going to be the final outcome. So I made tea. Honey and lemon? Nah. You've been married for six years, and I don't know how you take your tea. Thank you. You look whiter than usual after one of these episodes. Episodes? Uh, you've continually objected to the word dream, and this was the alternative which sprang to mind. Right now, I want to know what made today different, please. At the end, Captain Astrid lost consciousness. There was an explosion, and she hit her head. In the visions, I'm always seeing the world through her eyes. When she went under, everything went black. And that's when you woke up? No. That's when I panicked. I tried calling out, something I never did before. I heard you saying hello. And did you hear the reply? The what? The reply. If I'm not very much mistaken, for the first time, Captain Astrid might know about... Me. You have been listening to Dreams of Another Woman's Star, Episode 2, Balsamic Vinegar. Produced by Seat of Our Pants Players, written and directed by Dan Wenzel. Amy Astrid and Captain Astrid were Andy Gastingy. Anthony Astrid was Adam Gastingy. Hitomi was Rebecca Scheimer. Karana was Jill Wenzel. Dr. Harry London was Aaron Manka White. Nick was Rick Tennant. Dora was Dana Bonner Andreessen. The computer was Liz Music. Ambassador Golnix was Andrew Dell. And Goethe was Brianna Kumi. Music and sound effects by www.freesfx.co.uk. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll talk to you later.